Hi, I'm Hannah. Thank you for tuning in to this message by Pastor Stuart Payne, God of the Increase. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 to 7. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and this is what he says. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed. Okay, so in the church in Corinth, there were some uh, people that were saying, well, I'm siding with Paul, I'm following his teaching, and, and, and he's the man. And others were saying, well, Apollos is the one. He came along, and he discipled us. He, he taught us the ways of Jesus, and we're going to follow him. And what Paul was saying here is, like, you, f- you should be following Jesus. All eyes on Jesus. Um, so, um, verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither then he who plants is anything... Nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So this is what happened in the church in Corinth. Paul came along to the city of Corinth, and he shared the good news, which we know as the gospel, with the people of the city. And many Corinthian people became Christians. They became followers of Jesus. Apollos then came along after Paul had done his bit, And Apollos continued to preach to the Christians in Corinth, and he helped them to grow in their walk with God. He helped them to grow as followers of Jesus. And a follower of Jesus, another name for that is a disciple. But Paul did his bit. He shared the good news. Apollos came along and helped them journey with God. But it was God that gave the increase. It was God that was working behind the scenes to bring people into relationship with him, to bring people into a place where they wanted to follow Jesus, and where the church in Corinth became established and began to grow. So God gave the increase to the church in Corinth. Paul, the Apostle Paul, that was sent out, went all over Europe, including including the city of Corinth. He said this, though. He said, He wanted to make sure the Corinthian believers knew that it was God who brought the increase. All success in the church in Corinth must be accredited to God, not to people. And I just want to say that any success that we as a church in this city have, I'm talking about family church, I'm also talking about the church in Portsmouth, any success that we have in this city, we must always remember it's God that brings the increase. Amen? We must always accredit the glory to God for any good thing that happens amongst his people and amongst the lost when they come to Christ. So that's not to say that we as Christians don't have a part to play. Actually, Paul is pointing out here a couple of very important parts that he and Apollos had to play in the journey of preaching the gospel, the good news, and seeing people become followers of Christ. Um, But God is working in those things, amen? And all success must be accredited to God. So it's vital that we as Christians today, as God's people, we're doing what Paul and Apollos did because we've got to give God something to work with. So let's look at what Paul and Apollos did. First of all, Paul said, I planted. He planted. That doesn't mean he went around the city of Corinth planting nice flowers in flower beds. Um, That's not what the Apostle Paul did. What he did, he preached the good news of Jesus to the people of Corinth. And his words were like seeds that were scattered amongst the people. And in Matthew chapter 13, there's a there's a, a parable about how the, the sower sowed the seed and some fell on the path and it never took root. Um, other seed fell on the rocky ground uh, and its root was shallow. And so when the sun came down and, 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 and it scorched the plants because they had no root and they withered and died. And then other seed fell amongst the weeds and the thorny ground and it grew up but got strangled by the cares of life. But other seed, it, it fell on the good soil and it was received. And what Paul was saying is he scattered seeds in the city of Corinth as he preached the good news and some people received the seed of the good news, the gospel, in their hearts and they became Christians. They followed Jesus as their saviour. So the seeds that Paul scattered, they weren't just any seeds. The seeds that Paul Paul scattered were words and they were words of eternal life. 
or seeds of eternal life. And when we tell people about Jesus, every person who receives the words that we speak, the words of eternal life, they, they receive the seed of eternal life planted in their heart. Every one of us is responsible for scattering seed. I'll let you into a secret. It's not the pastor's job alone to scatter the seed, to preach the good news. It's every single Christian. As soon as you um, receive Jesus as your saviour, you have a responsibility, and that is to scatter seed. That is to tell people the good news of Jesus. Now, in this, its simplest form, this is the good news of Jesus right here. That God so loved the world. He so loved every person in this world that God stepped into this world. He sent his only beloved son. He came into this world in the form of a man, Jesus. He took our punishment for sin by dying on the cross so that whoever believes in him should not perish but will have everlasting life. We die naturally, but actually once you've received Jesus as your saviour, you do not die eternally. Spiritually, you live forevermore with God. Mark 16 verse 15, Jesus gave his followers, and that includes us, we're his followers, he gave them some very clear instructions that they should go throughout the whole world and preach the good news or the gospel to all people. And then later when Paul, the Apostle Paul, was writing to the Roman church, he said, he said these following words here, Romans 10, verses 14 to 15. He said, But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe on him? Okay, that's the first step to anyone receiving Christ Jesus as their saviour is to believe in him. And then he says, how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? We, church, you and me, we've been sent into this world, into our world, talking about our sphere of friendships, our community, to tell people the good news. Hello? We have been called, we've been sent into this world because how can people hear unless they're told? Amen? And the great thing is that God hasn't left us on our own to do this, but God has given us His Holy Spirit. In other words, God is with us by His Spirit, by His Holy Spirit in our lives. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, just before the disciples completely went out and turned the world upside down with the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, just before this happened, Jesus said to his disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be, this is Acts 1, 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power. You will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So our witnessing, our going out to share the good news of Jesus, we're not on our own. God's with us. He empowers us by his Holy Spirit to go out. So Paul planted. And just as Paul planted, he scattered the seed, the words of the good news, the gospel. We have been commissioned by Jesus to go out and plant seeds of eternal life by telling people about Jesus. And we have to take that seriously. Hello? We have to take that seriously. This is the great commission. This is the one thing that Jesus was really, really hot on. Because church, if we are not telling people of Jesus, of the goodness of God, by sending his son Jesus into this world, then people are not going to hear and they are not going to be saved. Now, on the 4th and 5th of April next year, we have a really exciting event coming to Portsmouth, and that is an event called Just One. And the evangelist J. John, anyone heard of J. John? Yeah. Right, J. John is coming to town. And um, for two nights, we've, we've, the church in Portsmouth together, we're hiring the Guildhall, 
um, in Portsmouth, and we're having two nights of evangelistic meetings. In other words, we bring people along to the Guildhall, and they hear the good news of Jesus proclaimed. Praise God. And the idea is called Just One, because basically what happens is every Christian that attends, you have to bring one non-believer with you. One person who hasn't yet begun a relationship with God. That's why it's called Just One. And I'm really excited because it's not just an event. There's going to be loads of training towards the end of this year, early next year. The church is going to be equipped in evangelism, personal evangelism. Um, and we're going to be training people how to go into their world and tell people about Jesus. Woo! So, Paul planted. What did Apollos do? Because we want to learn from, from what they did. So Paul planted, Apollos watered. Okay, so this doesn't mean that Apollos went round the city of Corinth with a watering can, watering all the flowers. That's not what Apollos did. What he did was he, along with other leaders in the church at that time, he taught the believers about God's kingdom. He taught the Christians, those who had become Christians by putting their faith in Jesus, he taught them how to walk with God, how to walk in God's ways, how to follow Christ and live as Christians. And again, this we know as discipleship. This is what discipleship is all about. When we use this big fancy word discipleship, all we're really saying is we want people, every single Christian, to know how to walk with Jesus and to take God's path for their life. Amen? So, so, again, we all have responsibility. It's not just the church leaders or the pastor. It's every single one of us. We have responsibility to help people in their journey with God. So, this is discipleship, and the instructions to make disciples have come directly from Jesus. Again, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, it says this. Jesus came and told his disciples... I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The reason he said that was because he wanted his disciples to know that he was passing his authority to them to now do what he was asking them to do. Verse 19. Therefore, go and make... Good over here. Right. Therefore, go and make... Of all the nations baptizing them, so this is how we make disciples, we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we teach them to obey all the commands that Jesus has given us. And be sure of this, again, this is great to know, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So just a quick recap on that scripture, Jesus has given us authority to make disciples, us because we're his disciples, we're his followers um, and how do we make disciples? We baptize people and we teach them how to live as Christians. That's what discipleship is all about. That's exciting. We all have responsibility, not just the pastor. We all have responsibility to make disciples. And we can be sure that God is with us as we do this. Because again, Jesus there said, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the very first thing that needs to happen in a new Christian's life what is it? Be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you have become a Christian recently, if you've said, Jesus, I believe in you. I thank you that you took my sin. I thank you for this new life, God, that you've given me. The very most important thing that should happen in your life is that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. God wants to fill you with his spirit. He wants to come into your life. He wants to bring his presence into your life and empower you to live as a Christian man or woman or young person. Amen? God wants to do that. What's the very next thing that needs to happen? Well, these things happen all at once, really. Uh, when you believe in Jesus, you've got to be baptized. You've got to be baptized. If you haven't been baptized in water, that means we dunk you under the water and bring you back up again. We br always bring you back up again. Um, if you haven't yet been baptized, you've got to be baptized because that is one of the most fundamental first steps that you have to take when you put your faith in Jesus. Baptism is simply a declaration that the old life has gone and that everything has become clean and new. Baptism identifies you with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. It's like your old life is now dead, it's buried, and you are living new life in Jesus. Amen? 
it's a declaration that, that says, I am going God's way. I'm declaring it to the devil, to God, and to everyone around me. I am going God's way. And guess what? We've got a baptism service coming up soon as well. Sunday, the 18th of August, we are going down to Eastney Beach in South Sea, and we are going to baptize, I hope, dozens of people who in the last few months have put their faith in Christ. If you have never been baptized before, then you've got to be baptized. There is just no way around it. It's a command of Jesus. It's a declaration that you're living a new life in God. Amen? Okay, so, so if you know someone in our church who is not yet baptized, encourage them to get dunked on the 18th of August. That's actually the Sunday immediately after summer camp, our youth camp. So I'm hoping there's going to be a number of young people who are baptized that day as well. Uh, another important step for us here in Family Church, we run this course called the Discovery Course. Discovery is, is a course for those who are new to the church, for those who are new Christians, and it teaches you how to pray, how to read your Bible, how to have a relationship with God, how to connect with your church family. And speaking of connecting with your church family, another step that we want every single Christian in our church to take is, is to join a connect group. You thought I'd forgotten about that, didn't you? Uh, just because we haven't talked about it loads for the last few weeks. You know, we've been letting our connect, connect groups get started. We relaunched in May. And um, we've had great buy-in so far. But I, I, I can tell you this, um, that we haven't yet got 100% of our church family in connect groups. Um, and, and we really want that because we really want you to have fellowship with one another. We really want you to build great relationships where you're accountable to one another, where you're growing in the Word of God, where you're growing in your walk with God, where you're encouraging each other um, to, to be witnesses in your world and, and to, to live for Jesus in your everyday life. So you've got to join a connect group, okay? Okay, all the people that are in connect groups are like, yeah, and those that aren't. <laughs> uh, but I just, you know, I'm passionate about this because um, we see that the impact that it makes on people's lives. So Paul planted, he shared the gospel. Apollos watered, God brought the increase. Without God's help, they couldn't have been effective in our lives. If we're going to share Jesus with people, if we're going to disciple people, we cannot be effective without God's help, without his Holy Spirit at work in our lives. When it came to people believing in Jesus and becoming disciples in that church in Corinth, and today, it's down to God, but we have to do our bit. God gave the increase. Jesus talked about this. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, he was talking to Peter, who had just declared that he knew who Jesus was. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter said. And Jesus said, I say to you that you're Peter. He'd been with him for three years. So um, I'm glad that he knew who Peter was. But he was declaring something else about Peter because Peter's name went, meant rock. He said, you're Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And Jesus refer was referring to two things here. First of all, that Peter was one of the apostles, one of the founders of the, 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 the first century church. Um, one of the building blocks that God used um, to, to establish his church on this earth. But also, Jesus was referring to himself. Probably more importantly, he was referring to himself and reminding Peter that he was the rock uh, that, up, upon which his church is built. He said, I will build my church. So who builds the church? Hello. Jesus builds the church. Jesus builds the church. We plant. We water. But Jesus builds the church. Amen. Psalm 127, verse 1. Oh, by the way, the church, in case you're new to church, the church isn't the building, it's the community of believers. It's the people of faith um, of the church. So Psalm 127, verse 1, says this. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. Who builds the house? Thank you, Mikey. <laughs> Jesus builds the house. Jesus builds the house, the house of God, the, the household of faith. It's Jesus' work. So as we've seen, it's important that we all play a part. One plants, one waters, but who brings the increase? God, Jesus. Same thing. 
I believe increase is coming. 20 months ago, I stood on this platform and I said, I believe increase is coming. God has spoken to us and God has told us to make room because increase is coming. Does anyone remember, remember that? Yes. I'm glad you all didn't say no. And I declared that we would be starting a second service on Sundays in order to make room for the increase, increase that we believe that would be coming to Family Church, Portsmouth specifically, but right throughout our church. So in order to make room for increase, last January, January 2018, we changed things around on Sundays and we started running two services on Sundays, 10 o'clock and 12.15. However, we've now decided to revert back to one service on a Sunday morning. We're going to go back to our original time of 10.30 from Sunday the 28th of July. Now we were talking about uh, last summer, we, we, we just went back to one service over the summer for the summer period. Um, but we've decided to go back to one service from Sunday the 28th of July, which means that we've got next Sunday the 14th, the one after the 21st, will still be double services, and then we're going back to one service. And this is simply because we are unable to sustain a strong 12-15 service because we have a lack of people on team in our 12-15 service and in our clear up after the 12-15 service. Now, we were never going to make half of you come to the 12-15 service. And clearly, as you can see, most of you want to be at the earlier service. 12-15 is over lunchtime. It's an awkward time. And we've discovered that. <laughs> Pastor Andy, um, a, a few weeks ago in Talking Church, which is our Tuesday morning thing, um, he said he'd rather be judged for trying something and failing than um, not trying anything at all. Um, and I don't think we've failed at all. But I think what we have done is we've tried. And um, what I've, I've decided is that I could ignore the fact that we are struggling. I could ignore the fact that there are many on team who are tired and weary uh, from 18 months of, of serving many people from 7 o'clock in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. That's an eight-hour day. Um, and um, they're all volunteers, as well as their full-time jobs, many of them. Um, I could ignore that, but I don't believe that would be honorable. I believe the honourable thing to do is to look at it and say, okay, so what are we going to do instead? Because we know that God said, make room for increase. So how are we going to do that rather than running two services? What's the plan? So we could ignore it and carry on. That's not honourable. There's people that are carrying far too much burden. So we're going to go out to one service. Does that mean, does that mean we believe that increase is not coming? Absolutely not. Don't be silly. Increase is coming. <laughs> it's the plan of God. <laughs> I'm not going to stand in the way of that. So, so we've had a good think, and uh, we want to be obedient to God um, regarding his instructions to make room for increase. We're going to reconfigure the layout of this hall to make one service really, really strong and to make space in one service for more people. And actually, we reckon we can get about another 150 chairs in this room if we rejig things a bit. Okay, so we're going to have space for growth. Ultimately, our plan for growth is we're going to get a big site in the city and we're going to be, build a big building and we're going to fill it with people that love Jesus. That's what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> so, yeah, don't get me wrong. We are big thinkers, aren't we, in Family Church? We know that God has big plans, and we are going to make room for the increase that God has for us. So that's the plan. We're going to go back to one service, 10.30, from Sunday the 28th of July. Um, the other thing I'm really excited about is that we can take a bit longer with our worship, and we can take a bit longer when we preach the Word. I am having to go at 100 miles an hour to get in what I need to say today, um, and there's preachers out there that like, get to preach for like an hour every Sunday. Now, I'm not saying we're going to go to an hour of preaching. Because um, that means the kids are out there for like two hours if we do that. And that's not fair on our kids' team, is it? Um, but what we are going to do is, uh, is we, it just means we can breathe a little bit with our timings and just relax a bit and, and yeah, give a bit more space for, for whatever God wants to do. So I just want to say thank you um, to everyone who has made double services possible by serving on team. Can we give people a round of applause? They know who they are.
Um, I'd just like to say particularly the kids team um, and also um, those that stay for the clear up at the end of the day. Um, often they've been at set up as well. Our hope is now that teams in the 1030 service will be stronger than ever. Um, and um, if you're on team in the second service, um, generally speaking, then we really want you to be involved um, on team in the single service when we go back to 1030 services. Um, we want to make a plan for anyone that is genuinely going to struggle to get here for a 1030 service. Um, anyone that generally comes to the 1215, uh, talk to us because we want to make a plan. And um, after today, the other thing is we want to finish in strength. So we got today, next week, week after, and then we're back to one service. And we want to, we don't want the next two weeks to be a real struggle and like no one to turn up for the 1215, all right? So um, can I just ask that, that um, we, we actually, we finish in strength, maybe double our efforts over the next couple of weeks to make sure that we're in a really strong position. And I'm loving the thought of it when we go back to a 10.30 service, this room um, being filled with people, yet there's space to bring others in. Um, and I just think um, it's really good to, um, to change things. Like this, is, this is a huge journey for me as a, someone that has never really liked change. But I think it's great to change things. It's great to say, right, is this working? No, it's not really working that well. Let's do this instead because we think this could work better. Amen? Yeah. So let's support the double services. Even today, clear up at the end, 1.30, if you can come back to help us. We've really struggled over the last couple of weeks. I want you to know that. Um, because in the book of Acts, it says the apostles devoted themselves to the word and to prayer, and they appointed people to serve at tables. Um, and I really, really am desperate to appoint people to serve at tables because I know that God needs me to be in prayer and in the word. And, but I'm also here from 7 till 3 every Sunday. I'm okay with that. Um, but boy, am I tired at the end of a Sunday. Um, and I just think I need to be effective in what, what the Lord has, has called me to do. Okay? Hello? Yeah. All right, we, we in agreement? So, so let, let's, um, let's double our efforts. And, and as we go back to one service, let's make it strong, strong, strong on every team. Today, there could be a number of different responses to what I've said. Maybe your response is um, that you want to make a fresh commitment in your life to being a planter, to being someone that sows the seed of the gospel in other people's lives, someone that shares Jesus with people. Maybe that's your response today. Maybe you feel like you need to do better at watering. There's people around your life who need to be discipled, who need to be taught how to be great followers of Jesus and how to take God's path for their life. But I think the most important response today is going to be from those who haven't yet made a decision for Jesus. If you are sitting here today and you have never said to God, I accept Jesus, your son, as my saviour. I recognise that when Jesus died on the cross, he took my wrongdoing, my sin, upon himself and he paid the punishment for my sin so that I could be made right with you. If you have never made that decision before, then today you have a chance to make that decision, to make your peace with God, to become a Christian, to become a Christian, to become a follower of Jesus. And let me tell you something, there is no better way of living. God has a plan for your life and it was always God's intention to have relationship with you. God is desperate for relationship with every human being that lives on this earth. And the only way to have relationship with God is to put your faith in Jesus. Is to accept that Jesus became your saviour when he died on the cross. Not only do you discover God's plan for your life on earth, but you have the assurance that when you die, naturally, you live for eternity with God in heaven. If you would like to become a Christian today, if you'd like to say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you, please would we all bow our heads now. Let's close our eyes. And I'm just going to pray a quick prayer that introduces you to relationship with God. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Because this is personal. This is between you and God today. Holy Spirit, I thank you, Lord, that you would...
touch lives. And that even now, hearts would be turned towards you. Would you just pray after me? Pray after me. Pray, dear Father, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price for my sin. I believe that you forgive me and you make me new. I surrender to you and ask you to be Lord of my life. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to live a life that honours you. So thank you for loving me. Amen. Thanks for watching. Remember you can listen to other messages on family.church or the Family Church app.